So one of the most frequent requests that I've received here on my YouTube channel is a video about Nick Fury. And this makes sense because with the rise of the popularity of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a lot of people have questions about the character Nick Fury. And a lot of people want to know what his role is in Marvel Comics. And ultimately, a lot of people want an answer to the question, why is it that if Nick Fury is Caucasian in the Marvel Comics, that he's played by Samuel Jackson, who's an African American in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? And so we're going to answer these questions and we're going to jump back into the past to the origins and the very first appearance of Nick Fury, work our way forward and ultimately answer this question. Why is it that Samuel Jackson, who is African American, is playing Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? So Nick Fury first appeared in Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos in May of 1963. He was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and the comic series ran for 167 issues. However, by the time the comic book came to a close, all we really saw were reprints of previous issues. What we saw was that with issues 1 through 80, a new uh, issue was coming out every single time it was released. But between issues 81 and 120, we saw a combination of reprints in addition to new issues, and with issues number 121 to 167, we saw a series of single reprints where there were no new issues being released. But at the same time, what's also most, most important, I think, about uh, Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos is that it broke ground in a lot of different ways when it came to Marvel Comics. The first being that under Stan Lee as the writer and uh, Jack Kirby as the artist, we saw our first African-American character that was on a main stage in Marvel Comics, and we had never seen this before. Gabe Jones was an African-American who was fighting alongside other multicultural individuals or a multicultural group in Marvel Comics during World War II, and this wasn't something that you normally saw. When you look at comic books with regards to World War II, you usually always saw white men fighting. You never really saw women, and you never saw anyone of any other kind of cultural descent. You always saw white Americans. And so for Marvel to release a comic that showed not only an African American fighting in World War II, but other people of other cultures, this was something entirely new. And in fact, when the first issue was sent for print, uh, what we saw was that uh, Gabe Jones was actually colored, or I guess recolored, as Caucasian because the printing company thought a mistake had been made and that they had actually made an error by making him African-American. Of course, Stan Lee sent a letter to the printing company and stated that uh, Gabe Jones was supposed to be an African-American and it wasn't a mistake. Now, when I say that Gabe Jones was the first African-American character, I don't mean to confuse this statement with individuals such as Falcon or uh, T'Challa, who is Black Panther. Black Panther was the first African superhero and uh, uh, Falcon was the first African-American superhero. So they really kind of broke ground in their own rights. Uh, what we also saw was that in the instance of this, this comic breaking ground, the second half of this was Gary Friedrich. And this was really kind of interesting here. After, uh, I think after the first dozen issues or so, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby stepped away from the comic. And the reason why is because around the time that Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos was released, we also saw the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man being released. However, at the time that uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby had stepped away, they had done this because Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and other comics like them with superheroes were gaining more prominence. And so they really kind of walked away from uh, Sergeant Fury and his Howling and commandos to focus on those stories. We saw that Roy Thomas had taken over the role of writing, and we saw that Dick Ayers had taken over the artistic aspect that was left vacant by Jack Kirby. After Roy Thomas had left, we had seen Gary Friedrich take over, and this is where the comic changed entirely. Where previously, under Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and even Roy Thomas, the comic had kind of played this arbitrary, um, archetypical comic book of the time. That is to say, they really kind of fought in some engagements, but there wasn't really a whole lot to it. Gary Friedrich took in the, in the direction of really kind of asking the reader to challenge their moral and political philosophies in terms of what they were reading and how they related to the world. One of the most notable examples was a story called The Assassin, where an individual encountered the Howling Commandos, and he was a hitman for hire. And the reason why this really called into question 
and moral philosophy was because he was a hitman for hire, but because his family was being held uh, hostage by the uh, by the Gestapo. And so the question became, if a man puts a gun to another man's head, but does so to save his family, does that make him an inherently bad person? It was stories like these that were really interesting and really kind of struck a chord with a lot of individuals and to this day remain some of the most popular storylines in Marvel Comics. Not necessarily because of the art artistic renderings, not necessarily because it was simply overtly uh, asking for morality, you know, that is to say the comic wasn't something along the lines of Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos and today we're going to challenge your moral beliefs. Uh, it was really just kind of the idea that it was giving the reader something else to look at. It was giving the reader or something more in depth than really just kind of an arbitrary fight that went on between uh, the Howling Commandos and some kind of villain. Now, ultimately, the uh, Howling Commandos came to a close, but as we'll discuss in the next section, we'll see that Nick Fury actually appears not only alongside the Howling Commandos, but at the same time appears as part of the CIA in Strange Tales. So Nick Fury became part of Strange Tales in August of 1965 with issue number 135. And initially, this was actually confusing to a lot of people. And even now, individuals who are going back and reading the publication history of Nick Fury will be thrown off by this because, in effect, Marvel was publishing Nick Fury in two different eras at the same time. And where we saw Nick Fury and Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos being portrayed as a rugged, devil-may-care uh, individual fighting alongside the Howling Commandos. In Strange Tales, we saw Nick Fury being uh, displayed or being uh, given to us as a suave and a very charismatic and very slick CIA agent. Now, the reason for this was because at the time, in the 1960s, James Bond was wildly popular, and so Marvel was looking to, to capitalize on the popularity of James Bond by turning Nick Fury, who had already been kind of a soldier, into a James Bond kind of character. But what we saw towards the end of the publication history with Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, that is to say, between issues 81 and 120, was this sort of migration, this sort of integration between the Nick Fury that we saw in Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, and the Nick Fury that we would come to see in Strange Tales. And we saw that by the end, or towards the end of Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, Nick Fury takes a piece of shrapnel to the eye. And so we're kind of left to presume that over the course of the time between the end of World War II and the time when he is recruited by the CIA as a spy in Strange Tales, that ultimately the damage to his eye necessitated an eye patch. And that's one of the reasons why Nick Fury wears his signature piece of equipment. Now, over the course of the Strange Tales comics, we really kind of see Nick Fury evolve and become the character that we have become the most familiar with. But during the Strange Tales comics, we saw the integration and the inclusion and the uh, uh, development of some of the groups that Nick Fury would both become a member of and a help to, in addition to an enemy of. Uh, in, in the Strange Tales comics, we saw the formation of S.H.I.E.L.D., and of course we also saw the return of uh, one of the most notable villains of Nick Fury, Baron Von Strucker. Now, Baron Von Strucker first appeared in Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, issue number five, and at the time, he was really just kind of a uh, Nazi officer. But by the time Nick Fury was in Strange Tales, uh, Baron Von Strucker had become leader of HYDRA, and HYDRA ultimately became the enemy of Shield. Now, over the course of the publication history of Nick Fury, as we move beyond Strange Tales, we begin to see that Nick Fury actually gets his own solo series in Nick Fury Agent of Shield Volume 1. Now, this comes about with uh, the end of the Strange Tales comics, which had switched over to Doctor Strange's own comics after issue number 168 in 1968. And what we see with Nick Fury Agent of Shield is that he has in fact become the director of Shield. And as Nick Fury Fury is now in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D., it begins to grow, and it begins to flourish more than it previously had. But then we begin to see that S.H.I.E.L.D. starts to change. We begin to, Shield, I begin to see that S.H.I.E.L.D. really kind of goes in a direction that Nick Fury isn't necessarily a fan of. And the reason for this is because at this time, when Nick Fury is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., he's actually not running S.H.I.E.L.D. S.H.I.E.L.D. itself is ran by 12 anonymous individuals that we never learn the identity of. What we see playing out, and the reason for 
Nick Fury's disillusionment with S.H.I.E.L.D. is the uh, existence of life model decoys, which had previously been introduced in Strange Tales, and where robotic decoys of various S.H.I.E.L.D. agents uh, becoming sentient, that is to say, gaining their own intelligence, and ultimately launching a campaign whereby they replaced S.H.I.E.L.D. agents with android replications. We ultimately see that Nick Fury is able to defeat the uh, the LMD threat, or at the time they were called Deltites, but we see that at the same time, he disbands S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, ultimately, S.H.I.E.L.D. is reformed by Nick Fury, but it's reformed in such a way to where it's much smaller than it had previously been, but it was still just as effective as it had previously been. We also see that over the course of the publication history of Nick, uh, Nick Fury, that he begins to lose his um, uh, solo comic. The uh, Nick Fury Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. comic actually goes away, and it was pretty short-lived. It was only about 15 or 16 issues, I think. And despite the fact that he had some other solo runs that popped up but didn't last very long, he remained a mainstay in the background of a lot of characters. And in fact, there has not been a comic book series belonging to a major superhero or a major superhero group where Nick Fury has never appeared. In addition, we also see that there are some storylines that come to fruition where Nick Fury appears or is a major part of. For example, in one of the more interesting stories, and in fact what people consider to be one of the best stories in Marvel comics, Comics, the Secret Invasion, we learn that Nick Fury is actually the first one to realize that the alien race, the Skrulls, who are the mortal enemy of the Kree and are a shape-shifting race of aliens, have infiltrated the planet Earth and began replacing uh, superheroes and individuals alike with Skrull uh, copies of, of these individuals. We see that Nick Fury actually goes underground. He disappears for quite some time, and he was able to organize a, a team together to sort sort of uh, launch a counterattack, and this pretty much is kind of how it plays out with Nick Fury. We don't really see him playing a great big huge role in Marvel Comics after his solo series really kind of come to an end. We see a reformation and a return of some members of the Howling Commandos, and then in 2005 we actually see a new version of the Howling Commandos, but it's really not the same. But despite the fact that Nick Fury really didn't have a long-running solo series, he has really kind of been a mainstay in Marvel Comics, and pretty much a appears almost anywhere, and if there is a major storyline involving a multitude of superheroes, you can almost always bet that Nick Fury somewhere is going to appear and play a role. So the question that I imagine most people have at this point, whether you're uh, unfamiliar with Nick Fury and have seen this video in an effort to learn more about his publication history, or if you're relatively familiar with Nick Fury but not as knowledgeable about his other versions, is why is Samuel L. Jackson playing the role of Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe when Nick Fury in the comics was Caucasian and Samuel L. Jackson is African American? In truth, this question is actually not the best way to phrase it. There actually is an African-American version of Nick Fury in Marvel Comics, but it's not in the mainstream comics that we've read or the comics that we've discussed in this video. There actually came a point whereby Marvel created something called the Ultimate Universe, and the Ultimate Universe was really just kind of a way for Marvel to not necessarily reboot characters, but to have characters gain their powers or come together as a group in a different way. And the reason for this was because because virtually all other alternate universe versions of Marvel Comics that we had seen, we had really just kind of picked up in the middle of everything. For example, with the Days of Future Past, we learned that there are still some X-Men around, although not in the same capacity, and they are not the same individuals. But we don't really know how it was that they came together as a group. We don't really know if they gained their powers the same way. We don't really know what road they took leading up to that point. We can presume, for the most part, that it was probably the same due to the fact that the only difference between that universe and the mainstream universe was the assassination of Senator Robert Kelly, but it's not given to us as an absolute. With the Ultimate Universe, it was given to us that way. We saw individuals like Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four gain their powers different ways, or in similar ways, but with slight changes. 
Nick Fury was one of these individuals that came about a different way, but we actually see Nick Fury uh, reimagined in an entirely new way. In the Ultimate Universe, Nick Fury is a general, and in the Ultimate Universe, Nick Fury is African American. Now, as I understand it, Samuel Jackson actually did not give his permission for Marvel to use his likeness, and Marvel had actually created Nick Fury to look almost exactly like Samuel L. Jackson. Now, I don't really know what steps were taken after Samuel L. Jackson learned learned that his likeness was being used, but at this point, I'd say that the only thing we can really do is kind of delve into the realm of conjecture, speculation, and just haphazard guessing, and say that there were probably a series of closed-door meetings, there were probably some non-disclosure agreements signed, some royalties paid, and ultimately, Samuel Jackson is playing the role of Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It could also be that because Samuel Jackson uh, looks exactly like the character Nick Fury in the Ultimate Universe, and the character character was designed to look like Samuel Jackson, that it was just a good idea on behalf of somebody at Marvel, someone who was as uh, part of the creative team and part of the decision-making team in the Marvel Cinematic Universe may have simply just sat down and said, hey, this guy looks like Samuel Jackson. He was designed to look like Samuel Jackson. Why not just have Samuel Jackson play the role? Ultimately, I don't really know here. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors in Marvel headquarters, but it seems to me that most likely an agreement was struck between Samuel Jackson and Marvel so that Samuel Jackson would play the role of Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So Nick Fury doesn't really have any superpowers. Uh, he is pretty much your garden variety human. But because of the fact that he has fought in World War II alongside, or in addition to the Korean War and the uh, Vietnam War, in addition to being a CIA spy and the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., he is pretty much the guy who's done it all. Um, he is the quintessential military strategist on the planet Earth in the Marvel Universe. There really isn't anyone who's as capable as he is in the realm of military strategy. In addition, Nick Fury is for the most part, immortal. Now, there's some debate about this in terms of whether or not he is actually immortal now, but there was a point in World War II whereby he was injured, and he was subjected to a dose of something called the Infinity Formula. And as long as he took the Infinity Formula annually, it would maintain his youth. Now, eventually, he stops taking the Infinity Formula and actually gives the last remnants of the Infinity Formula to Bucky Barnes in order to save his life. But Marvel says that because there were trace amounts left in his body and that they will always be in his body as long as he doesn't have a blood transfusion, that he will remain immortal. In addition, it was passed down to his son just because of the fact that it's part of his DNA now. And so his son, Nick Fury Jr., is immortal. Now, whether or not that means that his son, Nick Fury, will actually age or it will simply be like a, like a mutant gene where it will become active at a certain point, we don't really know. But what we do know is that Nick Fury remains ageless, and that's the reason why he always looks the same whenever you look at him in Marvel Comics, whether you look at Nick Fury from uh, the his I guess the Strange Tale storylines or Nick Fury in the Secret Wars, he's always the same. He is always or I'm sorry, Nick Fury in uh, the Secret Invasion. He's always the same. He never looks any different. In addition to this, Nick Fury also has very powerful individuals in his corner. He has the Avengers, the Fantastic Four. He also has some very intelligent individuals in his corner: Bruce Banner, Peter Parker, uh, Reed Richards, and so he always has access to virtually the best of intelligence. In addition to the best of technologies that are in the possession of S.H.I.E.L.D. So in truth, I don't really know there's much that we can do in the way of speculation when it comes to Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe outside of what role he may play or if he may return in the Marvel Cinematic Universe after the events of uh, Captain America the Winter Soldier. This is really kind of interesting when you look at this idea of the role of Nick Fury and his supposed death, uh, although we know that he is alive after the events of Captain America the Winter Soldier. And these events really kind of run parallel with the events of the Delta in uh, the Marvel comics. And it really kind of seems to me that despite the fact that it wasn't a rogue group of sentient androids that had replaced individuals uh, that were part of S.H.I.E.L.D. and ultimately resulted in, uh, in Nick Fury disbanding S.H.I.E.L.D., it seems to me that what will most likely happen is that uh, Nick Fury will return and will reform S.H.I.E.L.D., and it'll be very similar in the way that we saw in Marvel Comics, in the sense that S.H.I.E.L.D. will be smaller, but it'll be more controlled by Nick Fury. He 
he will be the absolute authority in S.H.I.E.L.D. Because as we've seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Nick Fury was not directly in control of S.H.I.E.L.D. The control of S.H.I.E.L.D. actually followed parallel with Marvel Comics in the sense that it was an anonymous group of individuals that were giving the orders. Now, unlike what we saw in the Avengers, uh, we, we didn't know what the who the individuals were in Marvel Comics, you know, as we mentioned. But uh, for me, I really do hope to see that Nick Fury returns. I really would like to see his character return because, in truth, I think that Samuel Jackson has done a fantastic job acting out the role of Nick Fury. And he really kind of seems to be uh, one of these individuals who is able to play the role in such a way that you really couldn't see anybody else playing it. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how you feel about the character of Nick Fury as he's been portrayed by Samuel L. Jackson, but I really couldn't see anybody else doing the job. I mean, he really has the charisma. He has the character down pat. You know, you really believe that he has this understanding of what it means to be a spy, of what it means to play out the role of a person who is both suspicious about the world around him, but recognizes that there are individuals that he does have to trust to some degree in order for him to be able to function in the role that's been assigned to him. So I really do hope that the character does return. I really do hope that we see Nick Fury again. As I understand it, Nick Fury is going to have a very minimal role in the Avengers Age of Ultron, and this makes sense because with Nick Fury, there were several times when he went underground where there were events where he normally would have appeared, but we simply just didn't see him. Um, but we are going to see, uh, hopefully I see, uh, Nick Fury in future versions. Hopefully we'll see Nick Fury in Captain America 3. Hopefully we'll see Nick Fury in uh, the film about Ant-Man because it really would be disappointing to see someone like Samuel L. Jackson who plays the role so well ultimately not return to that role after the events of Captain America and the Winter Soldier. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know and I will catch you guys later. Peace. Now, in issues number 44 through 47, what we learn is that Madame Medusa is part of a group called the Inhumans, and at some point prior to issue number 36 of the Fantastic Four, Madame Medusa had suffered from amnesia. She had been in some sort of a plane, uh, a plane crash, I think. Uh, we see that ultimately...